All right, this lecture we're going to look at Tan's article on Rawls's Law of People, where he addresses the topic of liberal toleration. Um, the nice thing about this article, in addition to Tan's arguments and thoughts, is that he gives kind of a nice overview of Rawls's Law of People. If you recall last week when we covered that, that was a very lengthy article. Um, I had to break it up in two lectures. Uh, it's, it's an important article as well. addresses some important topics uh, that are certainly related to many of the issues we're looking at in this class. Uh, but I still, uh, he breaks it down nicely, so that's one of the reasons why we read it. Um, so his main thesis, Tan's main thesis, is he's going to challenge Rawls's thesis in the Law of Peoples that well-ordered hierarchical societies should be tolerated by liberal societies. So to just put um, sample names, for example, supposing the United States is a liberal society by Rawls's standards, so that doesn't mean Democrat. Um, in a well-ordered hierarchical society, for example, could perhaps be like a monarchy, where there's a definite well, hierarchy, you're either royalty or you're non-royalty, and in some sense, the higher up you are in the hierarchy, the more rights you have. Um, in Rawls's thesis, it was that certain types of hierarchical societies, well-ordered ones, should be tolerated by liberal societies. Um, so, there is another book Rawls wrote called Political Liberalism, which is a book I haven't assigned because uh, it's more of a domestic, I guess you could say, book than global. Um, but in that book, Rawls addresses the issue within a liberal society of how stability can be maintained when there is deep and irreconcilable moral, religious, and philosophical diversity. Uh, so, for example, we certainly live in a society with a wide range of views, moral cases, for example, on abortion, uh, religious diversities, obviously there's freedom of religion in this country, and there's a wide variety of religions because of it, and philosophical diversity. Uh, well, that kind of plays into both moral and religious. Uh, for example, ethical views concerning utilitarianism versus non-consequentialist views of morality are in forming the moral debates about, uh, say, the status of torture, or uh, in harsh interrogation tactics in Guantanamo Bay, for example. Okay, so in people's philosophical intuitions, specifically in the subfield of ethics, influence their moral views about this. Okay, so what are we to do, though, with uh, this uh, diversity? Well, authoritarian suppression of differences wouldn't be an option in a liberal society, of course, because, uh, well, they just wouldn't be a liberal society anymore. It'd be authoritarian. Neither, though, would be a state imposition of liberal values across all areas of society. <laughs> so, which just seems to be an authoritarian imposition of liberal values, which, you know, again, it wouldn't be a liberal society anymore. Because, uh, according to Rawls, not all individuals accept the values of liberalism. For example, the ideal of autonomy as applicable to every single aspect of their lives. Some religions, which would be tolerated in a liberal society, would not see autonomy as a religious value, for example. Uh, instead, you kind of submit your will to a higher authority, such as the Bible or the Quran or the Torah or whatever. Um, so, obviously... You couldn't impose liberal values on every aspect or every area of society, like in religion, because that would, in some sense, be cutting away at the freedom of religion. So what Rawls thinks, then, is that stability can be attained if liberalism is detached from its own comprehensive moral doctrine and its application restricted to the political realm only. So, for example, liberal autonomy is only applicable to individuals as citizens, not as husbands or wives or church members or employees, etc., so it only pertains to public rights and duties. And that's basically the essence of political liberalism as well as sees it. So think about it. We all have different identities. Your identity as student versus boyfriend or girlfriend versus son or daughter versus brother or sister versus roommate versus neighbor versus teammate. And these different roles that we kind of adopt bring with them different duties and rights. Uh, so as a child... Growing up, you had a right to expect that your parents would feed you. And you had, I guess, an obligation to, you know, for the most part, obey your parents. Uh, you know, if they told you not to run across the street and 
heavy slate traffic areas, uh, which is different from your duties and rights with your siblings. Uh, anyways, I won't go through all this. This is pretty obvious stuff. Okay, so going back though, political realism though, uh, liberal autonomy only applicable to liberal realm. Blah blah blah. blah. When this occurs, liberalism, according to Rawls, has a freestanding status. It doesn't depend on any particular philosophical foundation, such as Rawls's own veil of ignorance, original position. Um, so this, there's a caveat, and that is that this does not imply that political liberalism would tolerate unreasonable doctrines, doctrines that are intolerant or violate the political rights of their members, such as the right to vote. So Rawls's restriction of liberal principles to the political realm is not a compromise. Instead, it's a requirement of liberal toleration. Unreasonable views are those that fail to meet the basic conditions for political liberal toleration. Uh, so, again, the United States isn't a perfect example because we don't completely match up to Rawls's conception of a liberal society, but it's the society that we've all grown up in, so I'm going to keep going back to this. Um, we, in the United States, tolerate most religions. However, sometimes a religion gets labeled as something like, I don't know, a cult. Uh, where they're engaging in dangerous practices such as, you know, mass ritual suicide, which uh, to uh, encourage by their charismatic founder. So in a liberal society, we tolerate most religions, but a religion that advocated mass ritualistic suicide of men, women, and children would not be tolerated in this society. In fact, uh, the leaders would probably be prosecuted. Um, so that would be an example of an unreasonable view. Uh, there was the Jonestown Massacre a long time ago, you don't remember this, where there was a very charismatic cult leader who literally convinced all the members, I think a lot, like 900, to drink poisoned Kool-Aid. Uh, and, you know, ever since then, there's been a phrase in popular culture, oh no, he's drinking the such and such Kool-Aid, like, he's drinking the religious nut job Kool-Aid, or the Republican Kool-Aid, or the Democrat liberal Kool-Aid, or the Scientology Kool-Aid. It goes back to Jim Jones, a cult leader who literally had his followers drink poisoned Kool-Aid. Uh, but you kids are smart. You have Wikipedia. You probably already knew that. But anyways, just putting some flesh. There is an end to tolerance, and I think most of you would share Rawls' intuitions about the limits of tolerance. Okay, so political liberalism. Uh, well, actually, say a comprehensive non-political doctrine within a politically liberal society could be internally non-liberal, yet be tolerated and reasonable. Many, reli sorry, many religious views are like that. Uh, they're internally non-liberal. Uh, there's a hierarchy, such as you know, priest versus lay person, where the priest has certain types of rights and duties that lay people don't, and vice versa. Uh, think about your job. You've often heard the joke that you know the workplace is not a democracy. You don't get the vote, and many of your employees probably don't like that. Uh, that's kind of just how it is, but you could say the workplace is internally non-liberal. There's uh, you're, You don't have rights that your employer has. Um, your employer could fire you at any time. You, uh, so, anyways, I'm not saying these are good or bad things, but this is just an example of something that's internally non-liberal that's tolerated within a politically liberal society. Alright, well, if you recall, in the law of peoples, in a sense, Rawls wants to globalize political liberalism. So, just to recall, the law of peoples extends this notion of political liberalism to relations between states via a two-step procedure. In the first step, representatives of liberal states participate in a global original position to arrive at global principles of justice. So, the representatives of these states get behind the veil of ignorance, not knowing what state they'll represent, and then they agree upon principles of justice. These are the seven principles of justice that Rawls thinks they would agree to. Um, it's not worth going through that list again. You should be familiar with it. The second step is to see if representatives of non-liberal states would agree freely to the same principles, though. So, um, for example, of course, Britain's a monarchy, but in a sense, they're more like a democratic republic now with their parliament and prime ministers. Uh, but we'll say, use the example of Jordan. Um, Jordan is a monarchy, and they're on very good diplomatic terms with the United States. We have a great relation with them. So, just uh, again, 
they don't perfectly line up with Rawls's conceptions, but it's you know to put a face to it, we'll use them anyways. So, and the assumption is that these liberal, these non-liberal states would agree freely to the law of peoples. Um, Rawls's contentious claim, though, according to Tan, is that liberal states must tolerate well-ordered hierarchical societies as long as they meet three conditions: one, that they are peaceful; two, they're organized around the common good conception of justice and consequently are legitimate in their eyes with their own peoples, and three, they honor basic human rights. Uh, so the peaceful condition just means that not going to be warring with one another, or perhaps just the liberal states. Um, they can be a hierarchical society, but have a common good conception of justice, and then have a legitimate government. Um, so the people recognize the monarchy. They accept it. They think that's part of their identity as being a member of such and such a state. Um, and then basic human rights, which doesn't necessarily mean free speech, but uh, people aren't being shipped off to concentration camps or hard labor camps if they, uh, for what we would consider to be very minor infractions. Uh, anyways, uh, but actually, I'll, I think Tan will say more about that, so we'll get to that later. Um, the second condition shows that well-ordered hierarchical societies are not liberal states, as no liberal state can be organized around a common conception of justice. So, for example, a religious conception of justice. Uh, it said that you've got to have a, allow for a variety of conceptions of justice within a liberal society. Uh, yet, these three conditions are sufficient, according to Rawls, for representatives to endorse the principles that the liberal representatives suggested. So... The well-ordered hierarchical societies are in good standing, and there is no reason for liberal states to attack them militarily or bring economic sanctions against them to revise their institutions. So, uh, again, we don't go to war with certain well-ordered hierarchical societies, even though they have vastly different values than us, nor do we bring economic sanctions. Instead, we do business with them. Um, okay. So, here's the question. Why, this is the question that Tan raises, why should liberal delegates be content with the list of principles as it stands as opposed to a more demanding list, in which case well-ordered hierarchical societies wouldn't be tolerated? Well, it's an important question. Uh, well, Rawls holds that tolerating well-ordered hierarchical societies is analogous to tolerating reasonable non-liberal comprehensive views within a liberal society. So, so it's like tolerating non-liberal religions within a liberal society. Uh, however, Tan is going to argue that this is a flawed analogy. First, in the, for the first reason, so basically there's some disanalogies between the two. First, in the case of comprehensive doctrines, what is permitted are moral, religious, and philosophical differences, not political differences. So any religion in a liberal society that restricts some of its members from exercising their political right to save vote wouldn't be tolerated, be considered unreasonable. So they, they have to have political rights recognized at least. But the problem is other states and the law of peoples, hierarchical states, uh, have political differences. Not just merely moral and religious. Some people don't have the same political rights as others. So that's a pretty important disanalogy. The reason why a liberal state cannot tolerate non-liberal political views, according to Tan, is obvious. A political philosophy cannot accommodate another competing political philosophy without undermining itself. So Ronald Dvorkin claims any political theory must claim truth for itself and therefore must claim the falsity of any theory that contradicts it. Uh, okay, it's pretty self-evident. All right, so um, please so prom. At the international level, Rawls advocates tolerating regimes with non-liberal political institutions. So, and I quote, it seems that while Rawls would say that a liberal state should criticize a domestic comprehensive view that forbids its members from exercising their public rights, such as the right to vote, this same state should not criticize a well-ordered hierarchical society that denies some of its citizens the same right. And this, according to Tan, seems blatantly inconsistent. Well, Rawls has a reply. Mainly, while domestic liberalism begins from a political conception of the person as a free and equal one rooted in the liberal public culture, to begin from similar assumptions in the international case would make, well, the basis of justice too narrow. 
We won't be able to get along with half the countries we try to get along with. Who are we going to have diplomatic relations with? Uh, that's, I guess, Wallace's worry. Now the question is, is that a legitimate worry? Well, Tan asks the same question and has an answer. He's going to say, well, why avoid this too narrow basis for a lot of peoples? Well, either liberal toleration requires that we do, or well-ordered hierarchical societies would endorse a moral liberal law of peoples. And of course, it can't be the first reason, because liberal toleration demands liberal politics. But again, why would the second reason be a good reason? Why should we tolerate non-liberal societies? Why should we restrict the law of peoples and minimalize it just so that we could intolerate more societies, more non-liberal societies? Well, this is what Tan's going to say is the serious error of the law of peoples. And I quote, A political theory cannot survive if one keeps amending its assumptions at every turn to reach results that don't seem to match the theory in its original form. This is simply a way of immunizing the theory against falsification. Um, so basically, sometimes a theory will have a revision that's what philosophers call ad hoc. And... Sometimes that's tolerable. Sometimes, though, when the theory gets too many ad hoc revisions, it's just just throw away the theory and find a new one. Uh, so imagine if we had a theory that the Earth is the center of the universe, but then we find out that we have better mathematical models that explain that instead of the Earth being the center, the sun is the center of the universe, or the Earth rotates around the sun. Well, you could say, well, the, the, the Earth is still the center of the solar system or the universe. It's just, the equations, you know, we'll just use more complicated equations to explain why the sun rotates around the earth instead of vice versa and the other planets. Um, that would be ad hoc. Yeah, you can do that. You can have the equation to show that, but it's so ridiculously complicated. Just throw away that theory and adopt a new one. And this is kind of what he's going to be charging Rawls with. Um, so it's important for political liberalism to have global scope granted, but it can only, but if it can only have that if it can only be endorsed globally by modifying its basic tenets, then Rawls has not succeeded in showing the global scope of his theory, according to Tan. He's just, it's time for a new theory, basically. Um, well, there's an objection, though. Mainly, there is nothing counterintuitive or inconsistent about responding differently to domestic and international non-liberal practices. One example of the difference is the fact that there is no de jure global enforcement body to enforce judgments a liberal state would make against non-liberal states. So yeah, valid objection. State state relations is different between um, than the relation between the state and its citizens. Two different entities that are being related. So of course there's going to be different rules and practices. Uh, I think that's a pretty good objection. Well, Tan has a response, though. He says, This objection neglects the distinction between making a judgment and acting on a judgment. That we may be forced to put up with certain illiberal practices overseas because of practical constraints does not mean that we need to judge them morally acceptable. Uh, this is like the descriptive prescriptive distinction. It's a descriptive fact that we tolerate non liberal societies, it doesn't follow that we ought to morally. Now, here's a question Do you think Tan really gets it, though? I don't know if Tan actually Tan actually responds to the objection though with this. They're not saying that it's a descriptive fact that we act differently in the international than at the national context. They're saying that given that nations are different from citizens of a nation, it's going to have different moral obligations between the two. It's two different types of entities. Um, here's an analogy: It's illegal to shoot human beings in the United States in the head because they die. And it's illegal to murder human beings because, well, humans don't come back to life. Imagine, though, if there was another species, we'll call them plumins, that looked exactly like human beings, only that if you shot them in the head, they were kind of like Wolverine from the X-Men. It just their kind of body kind of pushed the bullet out and healed within 30 seconds. So basically, you couldn't murder these people. Well, then, the laws about how we interact with those plumins would be different from the laws concerning how we interact with humans. Because they have a different nature. They're different types of entities. You can't murder a plumin. Therefore, you know, the penalty for shooting a plumin in the head should be a lot less severe, you would think, than shooting a human being. You would actually die and not come back to life. Well, it's the same thing. States aren't the same thing as citizens or members or individuals. So maybe you can have different obligations. So that's why I think 
Tan's response here kind of misses the mark. Uh, but here's a second response. In liberal societies, individual members have recourse to democracy in the political sphere. They are citizens of liberal democratic state. They are citizens of a... Sorry, I left out the indefinite article. Um, they are citizens of a liberal democratic state in addition to being members of particular non-democratic communities. So they actually can indirectly influence global policies by, so for example, voting for representatives, writing them, and so on, etc. So basically, though, in liberal societies, even if you're a member of a group, that you don't have certain types of non-political rights such as autonomy, even though you still have the political right of autonomy. Um, it's not true of members of higher societies. They don't have that recourse. However, so yeah, citizens of well-ordered hierarchical societies don't have that recourse in the political sphere. They can't indirectly influence global policies the way we members of liberal societies can. That's a pretty important disanalogy, I think. Um, and this, according to Tan, is going to undermine Rawls's two-stage original position. For if the representatives of well-ordered hierarchical societies in the original position are not democratically elected by their own peoples, it is very unlikely that they can meet Rawls's own stipulation that the peoples they represent are, well, represented reasonably. How can you, if you're not representing people that voted for you, how could you really represent their interests, I guess is the way that Tan has. And that would be the case in these well-ordered hierarchical societies. But it gets worse. The representatives of well-ordered hierarchical societies are not expected to engage in a domestic original position for determining domestic principles of justice. So, by allowing only delegates of those societies, who tend to be the ones benefiting from the domestic arrangements anyways, they're like the nobility, they are likely to settle on global principles that accept their domestic arrangements as being beyond rebuke. Huh, well that doesn't work out too well for the rest of them. So, goes back to this concept of toleration, which is what Rawls is concerned with and where Tan takes issue. The idea of tolerating non-liberal regimes is objectionable, according to Tan. This is, either be, this is because either it's a problem of application or a problem inherent with political liberalism itself. Toleration is an idea shared by all liberals. A central liberal belief is that the state should not discriminate between an individual's private conceptions of the good life. In addition to individuals, liberals believe that the state should tolerate different group based ways of life because of their moral significance to members of the group, which is why we tolerate, for example, different religions. But, this goes back to something I brought up a few slides ago. What would be the limit of this group-based toleration? Recall for Rawls, it's when it's unreasonable. However, he defines unreasonable. Another answer often given. Any group whose practices and traditions are antithetical to the liberal aspirations of their own members should be tolerated. So, for example, a group that does not permit its members the right and freedom to reevaluate and revise the internal practices and traditions of the group falls outside the bounds of liberal toleration. shouldn't be tolerated. Uh, Tan, though, recall, though, that political liberals wish to extend tolerance to groups who are internally non-liberal, which Tan's going to think is bad. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. So, many religions have what are called, like, dogmas or doctrines or... And those are the types of things, they have this conception of orthodoxy. And you just said it's something you don't question. And that is something that we tolerate in the United States. We tolerate religions that have those things. Uh, many of you are perhaps members of a religion like that. Many of you perhaps believe it. Tan is going to disagree. Uh, basically, he thinks it's bad. Not the good kind of bad, like one of the best albums out of the 1980s. But... More like that kind of bad. And I quote Tan, It is one thing not to expect individuals to be liberals in their private lives. It is quite another not to support whatever liberal aspirations they may have against oppressive group traditions. But, because of his, Rawls's reluctance to criticize the internal practices of reasonable groups, Rawls seems to have reneged on his liberal commitment to these individual dissenters. There is, therefore, a serious tension within political liberalism between its toleration of non-liberal reasonable groups and its commitment to the individual liberty of dissenting members of these groups. So, Tan is 
pointed out a problem with a lot of people's, and then said, oh, it trickles down to his political liberalism. So not just between state interactions, between domestic interactions as well. So as Rawls went in one direction, Tan's working in the other direction, and kind of just un trying to undermine Rawls' theory. Well, there's a response, though. There are two features of liberal democratic society that alleviate the tension. First, the state-enforced right of existing. Second, the liberalizing effects of liberal public policies. So this leads to a problem. There's a problem with the first strategy, well, at the international context. Mainly, is there a meaningful and substantial right of exit in the international context? And, uh, eh, oftentimes, no. So Tan's issue is there could be no right of exit unless there's a corresponding right of entry. And Rawls and many liberals are actually reluctant to admit a right of entry. Uh, this ties back to the stuff we looked at in immigration a few weeks ago. Uh, but he's, he's going to make the claim that you can't have a right of exit from a country unless you have a right of entry into a country. Like one entails the other. Uh, Tan writes, and I quote, In the domestic setting, when one leaves one's private association, one is able to join another even if it is the default community, as when one leaves the church and joins a secular community. In international society, on the other hand, you cannot leave one's country unless you're adopted by another country. Uh, Edward Snowden knows this now. <laughs> um, problem with the second feature. The way in which political liberalism liberalizes in the domestic sphere are not available in the international setting. For example, public education. Of course, there is an exception. Hollywood. <laughs> uh, American movies are very popular overseas, at least in quite a few countries that I've visited and have friends that have lived in or visited. Um, you may not know this, and you might be embarrassed by this. I certainly am. In the 90s, Baywatch was the world's most popular TV show in the world. Well, good for the Hoff. Maybe that's not embarrassing. It's the Hoff. No, I'm joking. Um, there's also books and music, etc. But on Rawls' reasoning, the governments of well-ordered hierarchical societies have the right to censor these ideas contradictory to their common good conceptions of justice. So free expression just isn't one of those rights a well-ordered high society must offer citizens on Rawls' theory. So, so much for the politically liberalizing ideas kind of being spread throughout the population. All right, that is it.